So this is astrophysics greatest hits. This is what I think is the most impressive physics around astrophysics. That's the study of space, the physics of space. It all starts with Galileo. That's when really our exploration of space becomes quite scientific. Before that, we did know very accurately, really, the kind of paths and patterns, and uh, we could predict the patterns and stars for quite a long time into the future. But Galileo was really the first one to treat it like a physicist. So the first thing about Galileo and his most sort of famous and most important thing is his treatment of gravity. Now, it is often said that he dropped two cannonballs off the side of the Lean Tower of Pisa. Whether he did that is actually questionable, but it certainly was an analogy that he maybe gave. His experiment was actually using cylinders rolling down ramps. And if you think about the way he managed to measure times really accurately, which just like sand timers, hourglasses. And he came to this conclusion, one marked Galileo, that actually two objects, which were the same apart from having different masses, would both hit the ground at the same time. Obviously, intuitively, most people think a heavier thing, one with more mass, will hit the ground first. And that is not the case. All things accelerate at the same rate under gravity. This is g, the acceleration due to gravity, 9.81 meters per second squared. Of course, in reality, on Earth, we find that a hammer and a feather, for example, will fall at different rates. But that is not because of their mass, that is because of the effect of air resistance. They t tried this out, just to be absolutely sure they tried this out on the moon and they did find that in the absence of air resistance the hammer and the feather hit the ground at exactly the same time. Galileo invented the telescope, he was the first person to really make a optical telescope. These are his telescopes that he made here, they're just um, a lens at one end and a lens at the other end all wrapped in this kind of resin and cloth, so this stiff kind of tube. And I promise you, it is amazing to look through a simple telescope. If you ever get the opportunity to look through a simple telescope and see what Galileo saw, because with those simple telescopes, Galileo was able to observe Jupiter and four of its moons. And we now know Jupiter has over 70 moons, and that, that number keeps getting bigger. You know, when I first started teaching, that number was more like 60. And um, But the four that you can see through a really simple telescope, and you can see these moons through just an ordinary telescope that you can buy for 30 quid in, in a store. These four moons we call the Galilean moons because they are the moons that Galileo actually recorded. You can see them, you can make out Jupiter. With the naked eye, it just looks like a kind of yellowish bright star. But with a simple telescope, you can see these four moons orbiting in a kind of like disc around Jupiter. You can also see that banding, that kind of famous Jupiter banding. And you can see that with a really simple telescope. Give it a try sometime. So what comes after Galileo is Kepler. And Kepler made careful observations and records of orbits. And this is the first time that we really started treating orbits with maths. So Kepler's laws are about the mathematical expression of planets' orbits. He spotted this thing. This is supernova 1604. So that's how we code what we see in the night sky. Sky SN means supernova and 1604 is the date. And we can see it. I think that's a Hubble photo, Hubble Space Telescope photo. And we can see the nebula that's been left over after that supernova. But this is a kind of record of what Kepler noticed about the orbits of the planets. They weren't going around the Earth in circles. They weren't going around the Earth at all, he figured out. It appeared as if they were coming kind of closer to Earth and then spiraling further away, like this kind of spirograph pattern that you see here. And the reason for that is because, of course, we are not at the center of our solar system. Kepler's laws then. And these laws are in A-level physics. So firstly, all planets have elliptical orbits. That's an important first law that actually Orbits are not circular, they're ellipses. And there's a different maths that you need to use for ellipses. And the sun is at one of the foci. So the center of gravity of an orbit is the sun, or any large mass if you're talking about another orbit. And for our planets, it's the sun. And the shape of that orbit is not circular, it's elliptical. Secondly, the orbits sweep out equal areas in equal times. So you can see this little graphic here. Orbits sweep out equal areas in equal times. Now, what that means is that when it's closer to the center of gravity, an orbiting body moves faster because it does each kind of slice. If you think about carving an elliptical pizza or something like that, and you want to give out equal slice areas, it means that the circumference, the kind of arc of that area, needs to be longer 
when the distance to the center of gravity is shorter. So equal areas and equal times implies that it's going faster when it's closer to the center of gravity. And lastly, this is about the period and its relationship between the size of the ellipse, essentially. So the second axis is the shorter axis of an ellipse. And the orbital period squared is proportional to the second axis cubed. So that's in that maths up there. And these are real, this is real maths that you need to apply in your A-level. So let's Kepler, let's move on to Hubble. And this is something that you probably know from GCSE, or if you haven't studied it yet in GCSE, it's a big part of the GCSE physics syllabus. Edwin Hubble had one of the most powerful telescopes in the world. He lived in California and his telescope was on the mountains above California. So that's kind of ideally placed to become world famous. Edwin Hubble was a rock star of physics. <laughs> This telescope was actually powerful enough to see other galaxies. So he made records of other galaxies, not other stars, but other galaxies. Because what he needed to do was to measure distances and he needed to measure speeds. So how did he do the distances first of all? Well, that's Proxima Centauri, that's our closest star. And that's already 4.2 light years away from us. Now I want to talk about astronomical distances, okay? Very, very large things we call astronomical. Well, astronomical distances are large numbers. Um, one astronomical unit, one AU, is the distance between our planet and the sun. Okay, so that is in meters. It's a useful unit. It's a very, very large unit. It's 150 billion meters, look there. That's a pretty large distance. One light year is the distance light travels in a year. Now remember I said Proxima Centauri is 4.2 light years away. So Hubble's got to measure these incredibly large distances. Now how do we measure distances in space? Well, there's two main ways that we measure distances and that's the inverse square law and the trig. And I'll talk then about how he measured distances to galaxies which are even further away from this. First of all, this is the rule we use for stars that are close by. It's called trigonometric parallax. So try this out for yourself to, so you understand the principle. Put your finger or your pen or something out in front of you and then close one eye after the other and notice what seems to happen to the finger in the field of view if you compare it to the background. So what seems to happen is when you look at it through one eye and then the other, it actually appears to move. It obviously isn't moving, but relative to the fixed background, it does appear to move. Now actually we could optically measure that angle, the, the angle through which it appears to move. And by just then using a little bit of trigonometry, we can work out the distance to that star. So we call that angle the parallax angle. It's marked with a little P in this picture here. And the distance to the star is D. So we're comparing where a star looks like it is at two sides of Earth's orbit. So can you see there's Earth going around the Sun here. One AU is the one astronomical unit that I just alluded to earlier, the distance between the Sun and the Earth. That is then one side of a right angle triangle. So optically, we measure that parallax angle and we know the distance between us and the sun and we measure that angle kind of twice after six months of our orbit, maybe January to July, that's six months apart in our orbit. And we would see the angle between, the difference in angle between those two, that's our parallax angle. And therefore we can do a bit of trigonometry to work out the distance. So it's all about comparing where the star is to the background of fixed stars. The next one is standard candles and the inverse square law. So if we want to measure distance to a star, we can use what we call a standard candle, which is a standard light source. So how does a standard light source behave? Well, it spreads out its light over a sphere. So you think about the power that the star is giving out, its luminosity, we call it. That power is being spread out over all this surface area of the sphere. So if you get a distance r away, then it's spread out over a certain area. So we, we call that power over the area, we call that the intensity. If you go 2R, so twice the distance away, then it's actually spreading over an area of four times or whatever the area was before. So we have an intensity which is a quarter what it was at distance R. If it goes three times as far, you have an intensity of a ninth. If it goes four times as far, you have an intensity of a sixteenth. Hopefully you're seeing kind of pattern here. It is inverse square. So we say that's the inverse square law. The intensity is proportional to the inverse of the square of the distance. You go twice as far away and you get a quarter of the intensity at that point. So with that model, and because we know a pattern related to the color of the luminosities of stars, we can compare that to this inverse square model. And we can very quickly, by measuring the intensity here on Earth, work out the distance that that star is away from us. So those are two of the ways that we can measure distance in the universe. So to measure the distance to distant galaxies, Hubble measured their 
angular diameter, and because all spiral galaxies have roughly the same magnitude, the same size, he could therefore work out their distance from Earth because a further away thing has a smaller apparent size, a, a smaller apparent angular magnitude, a smaller apparent angular diameter. That's how he worked out the distance to those galaxies. How did he work out the speed though? This is redshift. So how did he measure the speed of these galaxies? Well, he used Doppler shift. So you might have heard a race car goes neom as it goes past you. That means that the sound is actually getting a higher pitch, a higher frequency and a shorter wavelength as it's coming towards you. And as it's moving away, it's getting a lower pitch. It's getting a longer wavelength. And the same thing happens to light. As something's moving away, we can say it's red shifted. It's light is actually shifted towards the red end, the longer wavelength end of the spectrum. So when something is moving very rapidly away from you, we say the light is red shifted. It is actually, the light is actually shifted towards the red end of the spectrum, it's getting a longer wavelength. Its wavelength is increasing, its frequency is decreasing. If something was moving towards you, it would be blue shifted. That means that all those waves are bunching up, getting a shorter and shorter wavelength because the object is moving towards you. Now, Hubble did not find many galaxies that were blue shifted. The majority of them, but almost every single galaxy he looked at was red shifted. So what was the conclusion that he came to? It was that the universe is expanding simple as that. The further away a galaxy was, the faster it was moving away from Earth. So as with all good science, they repeated this and it comes out time and time again that the further away a galaxy is, the faster it is moving away from us. In fact, those two things are proportional. The distance a galaxy is away from Earth is proportional to its recessional velocity, i.e. the speed it's moving away from us. So if you double the distance, you get double the speed moving away from us. Amazing, right? Now that conclusion was absolutely incredible and it led to the Big Bang Theory, which I'm sure you'll have uh, learnt about in your GCSE physics. We name the Hubble Space Telescope after, and it's one of our crowning achievements as a human race. The Hubble Space Telescope is a collaboration between NASA and ESA. So NASA is the American Space Agency, and ESA is the European Space Agency. I would encourage you just to spend some time looking on Hubble site. It's an absolutely free resource, which is just the photos that Hubble has produced for us. It's incredible. One of the most incredible photos that the Hubble Space Telescope has come up with is the Hubble Deep Field image. I encourage you to Google that. Every single dot on that image is another galaxy. That will make you feel very, very insignificant, very, very small. This equation is very interesting. It's about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. There's a scientist called Drake that came up with it. It's a way of working out the number N of intelligent and communicating civilizations that are in our own galaxy. So let's just work through the maths. Look, take a bit of paper or something and work out some kind of estimates of what you think the value of N will be. In our own galaxy, how many alien civilizations are there that could be communicating into space? So N is that number. Firstly, the first term is R, the average rate of star formation in our galaxy. And we think there's somewhere between three and maybe 10 stars per year being formed. So pick a number between them. FP is the fraction of formed stars that actually have planets around them. So our star does have planets around them. And we think that that could be anywhere between like 0.3 and 0.5 maybe. So that kind of fraction, you know, three tenths or five tenths. Uh, just write that down as a decimal, I'd suggest. Any is for stars that have planets, how many of those planets could potentially um, support life? So in our solar system, there's kind of two, Earth and Mars. Mars has an atmosphere, it could potentially perhaps has in the past supported life of any kind. So any is just that number. There's two on our star, so you know, take an educated guess. Maybe on average there's one or on average there's four. You decide or you pick a number for that one. And then FL is the um, fraction of the, those planets that you've just decided that actually support life, that actually have life kind of evolve on them. So you know, as if we said there were two, there's Earth and Mars, then just one of them that we know about, or perhaps both of them actually have life. So it might be a number between one, a half, or you might be less optimistic about that. And you might think it might be as low as like a quarter or 0.1 or even less. And then the next one is the kind of fraction of those life forms that actually become intelligent. It's questionable whether we are an intelligent life form, I guess, the way we treat our planet, but a fraction of those life forms actually become intelligent. So do you think they evolve? They all evolve to become intelligent? Only half, a quarter, you pick a number. The next is a fraction of those civilizations that actually develop some kind of communication. So i.e. they can communicate out into space. 
And then lastly, L is the length of time that those civilizations actually release the detectable signals. So if you think about our civilization so far, it's quite an old civilization, really. 7,000 years it's been here, but we've only been releasing signals into space for, uh, well, actually, since the Nazis broadcasted the Berlin Olympics into space. So less than a century. How long do you think we might go on doing that for? Maybe we'll go on for several millenniums with that kind of level of technology, maybe not. Basically multiply all those numbers you've just decided on and that's the number of uh, intelligent communicating life forms that there are, intelligent communicating civilizations that there are in our galaxy. Um, numbers, the problem with this is that estimates vary from like tiny, 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 tiny decimals, 10 to the minus 13, and kind of millions or billions of possible civilizations in our galaxy. So it's, it's kind of crude science, but it's a really interesting consideration of how many kind of alien life forms, alien civilizations might you expect there to be. The very last part of this presentation is going to be about Hawking. Now, Hawking wrote a book called A Brief History of Time. And uh, this is the reason why he is such a famous scientist. Okay, he really, he studied and he learned about, he taught about black holes. That's, that's really where his main science is. But he also went into lots of details about the Big Bang and the evolution of our universe. And I, find, I think this is some of the most fascinating stuff that you learn about in GCSE or A-level physics. So um, this is how a black hole is formed. Uh, basically, at the end of a star's life, we get this expansion and cooling into becoming a red giant. And in that phase, there's this separating out of all the different elements that the star has formed as it's done nuclear fusion of all the elements up to iron. And you get this incredibly dense iron core is right in the center there all the other elements kind of separating out into these layers when the gravity can no longer keep that into that shape we get this kind of collapsing in on itself we get these layers collapsing one by one in on the previous layer and eventually have this big kind of bounce of all of those atoms off this incredibly dense core and that's what gives the so much energy in the supernova you get this blast and after this blast there can be two things can happen you can leave behind a neutron star or if it's got enough mass enough energy then you could rip the fabric of space-time itself here's a guess of what might happen but uh, what would be left behind would be a black hole hawking also worked on um, the large-scale structure of the universe and this is kind of where we're at now about understanding what the universe might look like if you could zoom out then the universe would look like this like a web of kind of spindly fibers and, and void in between this kind of web like structure linking together super clusters of galaxies so our galaxy would just be one tiny little cluster in one tiny little speck of light in this kind of picture of what our whole universe might look like and then there's the question of the ultimate fate of the universe and this is absolutely Absolutely fascinating and when I was a young person when I was studying A-level physics it was really convincing that we'd have maybe the bottom path there where the critical density uh, of the universe was large enough that actually the universe might contract and we'd have a big crunch and then we'd have another big bang and then we'd have a big cr crunch and we'd have another big bang and then we'd have a big crunch and actually we are just in one of those kind of phases where the universe is still expanding what's actually happening the latest data suggests that the universe is actually accelerating it's actually expanding at a faster and faster and faster rate each time we measure it and this is incredibly exciting for physics and it's also a kind of step into the unknown we have no idea what's causing that we have no idea what kind of energy could be pushing that we've tried to measure it we're looking for it with our telescope but all we analyze about the universe is the light that comes from these distant objects and this stuff this dark energy and dark matter doesn't seem to be interacting with any light that's why we call it dark energy and dark matter so here's where we are with physics right now we're a question we do not know the answer to but uh, studying GCC and A-level physics is, is your first step into being part of that first step into being part of answering those questions about why we are what we are why the universe is like it is and that's what's fascinating about physics. <laughs>